I'm very pleased to welcome into this session that we're doing uh, for the case of Hazelwood versus Colmeyer, Mr. Bob Sturgis. And um, Bob is joining us. We're taping this actually the Thursday before the event. Uh, Bob has some other events that came up last minute. And uh, um, Bob, Bob was the journalism teacher at Hazelwood East high school, literally uh, up until April 29th of 1983, which was literally two weeks before the next edition of the Spectrum paper came out. And we're just going to talk about, about the case. And uh, Bob, welcome. Uh, I know you're in St. Louis. I'll ask you at the end to talk a bit about your organization a seat at the table, which is a remarkable group and organization that you run. But welcome to uh, this event that we're taping. Thank you so much, Steve. And it's my privilege and honor, but kudos to Kathy and all of you who have kept us uh, alive in people's minds. I know even some of my own sons uh, will read about it in their textbooks when they went through high school. They're all sure. post-college now. Anyway, it's funny to hear that, but it's sad that it turned out the way it did. But anyway, there's sure. much more of a story than just the court case. You're right. Sure. And, and you know what? That's a good lead in to my first question. And that is when all this was happening and uh, and and, you know, I gave a little background of when you actually started at Hazelwood East and, and your work there. But when all this started and then after the fact, uh, obviously, the event itself took place back in 1983. The court decision was in 1988, the U.S. Supreme Court case and certainly a landmark case. Did you ever think when all this was happening, either when you were there at Hazelwood East or after the fact, that it would become and still is such an important landmark court case of the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, fortunately, we'd studied journalism law in class. And we'd read things about Tinker and other court cases along the way. So I wasn't, and none of us were naive about what the law of the land going into this was, but um, never envisioned that it would turn out this way. Um, we. I think we won five to four at the uh, in the in the district, and um, anyway, it, uh, I I got there in 1980 before uh, from Hazelwood. I came from another district. I taught there previously. I came to Hazelwood in 1980, and um, and I just had phenomenal students. One of the reasons I came is because they had um, really good students who uh, had a, a pretty good student or a teacher before me. Um, and unlike a lot of schools, unfortunately, as you're probably aware, uh, sadly, a lot of journalism programs are nothing more than the most popular kids walking the halls with hall passes and taking mm -hmm. pictures of their friends. Sure. These were kids literally who went on to work for the likes of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, went to Missouri J School, journalism school, and they were very serious about it. And they, you didn't come in that class if you were looking for an easy ride. It was probably tougher Um I think the one class, uh, one headline in our yearbook said, "Toughest class you'll ever love," or something like that. And it really was. It was. It was hard work. We made. I made sure they weren't in there for those, just you know, goofing off reasons. And they they were very serious about it. When all of this started, uh, you know, the first question that I always like to ask, and I remember asking this. Uh, eight or nine years ago when we had an event at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and, and the principal, Mr. Reynolds, was there. And, and, and the question that I want to ask you is, uh, you know, everyone talks about the fact that, that, a number, that five or six years before this event happened, that there were articles written in this, uh, in the, on the newspaper or for the newspaper that dealt with teen pregnancy and also dealt with divorce. Am I correct in that? I don't know that factually, but I know the teacher before me, and I know she would have not shied away from those. So I can't speak to actually seeing those articles or knowing of them firsthand, but I have no doubt, uh, although I don't know that Gene was the same principal back then. I, sure. I also I thought he was relatively new when I was there as well. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and with that, you are correct. Um, 
tell me what led up to all of this uh, from your perspective. Obviously, we will be hearing Kathy. She, she's already, uh, um, when she does this live, and we're, we are recording this again uh, five days before the event on Tuesday the 15th. But from your perspective, things that led up to it, uh, just talk in your own words uh, of what it was like uh, and and just uh, how the students reacted up until the point when you left about two weeks before the actual publication date. Well, the, the sad part is things were going very well up to that point in this respect. We, those students, the credit goes to them and I did my best to, to work them hard. I studied under probably did my master's work under the toughest teacher, journalism teacher in the area, uh, Homer Hall. If uh, anybody going through Mizzou J School would know he was the dean of all um, journalism teachers in the St. Louis area, maybe even in the nation, the Kirkwood Call, which is rather famous in journalism, uh, uh, was literally one of the top newspapers in the country. Uh, and they had a relationship unlike probably any other high school in America where they would publish really meaty things. So that was our kind of our role model. And we were publishing I, very good in-depth stories. We were not doing the football features and the prom queen and all that. It wasn't our shtick at all. And so these kids were very serious about everything they did. This happened, this particular issue at the end of the year was something though the consider it like a term paper. It's something they had worked on from the beginning, um, really doing deep dive research. And it was their meant to be their portfolio piece for the kids for going on to the likes of Mizzou J School. And and that's the pain of it all is that nobody worked harder on anything than this one. And my basic problem with the whole thing, the way it turned out, law aside, uh, it was a horrible teaching moment in terms of how do, what did we end up teaching the young people? Um, I think in my estimation, and I said it to Gene, is we had an opportunity to teach them how to handle conflict, how to resolve differences, or to ask questions. And if you were really interested, and if he was interested, he, well, I, so I understand he was told the names that he was supposedly worried about violating privacy were never going to be in there. They were only in there so that editors could proof and verify the quotes and the, and the sources and the like. That's just standard procedure if you know anything about journalism. And again, that may say a lot, whether he cared to know or he did know that, but I certainly told him that. I think uh, the subs, the guy who came in after me to finish out just the rest of the year when I went into private business, uh, the business world, um, told him that. And so that concern about, quote, unquote, violating privacies and the like doesn't hold water because their names weren't going to be in there. They weren't necessarily going to be, uh, I think, uh, and the whole intent was to help young people, not to hurt them. The parents of the people involved were even okaying any use of situations, albeit they were going to be anonymous. So if the parents were okay with it, um, anyway, I, the net of it is, I think, knowing all that, he could have worked this out if he'd bothered to communicate. Mm -hmm. He didn't bother to communicate. He used mm -hmm. power instead to just remove. And yeah. basically took him off. Think of it this way. You got a kid who's going out and playing for a state championship football. I would have never seen them remove somebody off the football field as fast as they move this out of the public domain. When when all this came down, if you will, prior to when you left at the uh, the end of April, uh, um, how, how involved were the students at that point and how aware were they of everything that was happening prior to the the center section of the spectrum being yanked out by uh, by Mr. Reynolds? Yeah, sadly, I, they had no clue it was coming. I, I don't think I, I didn't. Certainly, I was gone, in the, but I got the call after the fact, saying it was gone, and uh, and then just tried to help as best I could, offering the ACLU as a contact and the like. And it was really, what could we do after the fact? And that wasn't going to happen. School was about to end, and there was no way they were going to go back and and do it. And I, you know. Um, so it was it was a sad moment, but uh, they none of us really knew ahead of time. It just we just got blindsided. That's what I meant. Instead of communicating, instead of teaching the value of communication and and the value that the young people bring to us, uh, he chose not to do that, and that's that's the big loss. Mm -hmm. As an educator, that's the last thing we should be doing. Sure, and and then uh, with regards to 
the advice and the suggestions that, that you gave to Kathy and others after the event occurred, when I say the event, after the, that section of the newspaper was, was purged, if you will, uh, getting them involved with the ACLU was obviously a major, major move and major step. Uh, um, what was that process like for you? And, and then how closely did you follow the story after you left? Quite intensely for a while, as much as I could, starting a new job in a, a billion dollar corporation. I was, you know, I had a lot of time and energy I had to go there, but I tried as best I could to stay in touch, particularly through Kathy and, and actually the, the guy who came in after me. I'm, I'm to this day still very much respect him and, and love the guy. We're, we're good friends. Uh, I think he got caught in an awkward position. And as I said, I think he knew the political climate from above and he knew this would probably not uh, be one of their favorite issues, so to speak. Sure. Uh, so I, I did what I could and getting the student uh, pr a press center, a student law center and, and ACLU. My last question for you, Bob, is tell us a bit about the, the 501c3 foundation that you're involved in. It's called A Seat at the Table and what that's all about. Uh, what that is about, but and first of all, kudos to Kathy and, and all of you who've stayed involved again. I, she's just, she has carried this torch for so long and she deserves a lot of recognition from all of us. So uh, I hope her name never gets removed from public eye in that respect. She's, she's, she's phenomenal. So uh, she's a seat at the table. We help at risk 18 to 25 year olds by providing them a home where they typically don't have one. A lot of young people uh, might grow up with very unstable homes or, you know, families of origin and home life. They might be in a youth group or a church group or a, a, non a nonprofit organization up to age 18. But the problem is after age 18, a lot of that falls off. They're, the young people are expected to be the man or the woman of the house or get out of the house. And that's not a winning proposition. And some of the, we work with four partner organizations in St. Louis and they've got good eyeballs on these kids. They know they're resilient. They know their great character but have nothing at home to help make them thrive into adulthood. So we identify those kids and try and put them either one at a time in an existing home, or we've right now we've purchased two homes in St. Louis. My wife and I have four young guys living with us. We're putting four young women in a house that I'm sitting in right now up in Ferguson, Missouri, a, a North County suburb of St. Louis. Sure. And we hope to open chapters in Cincinnati, Kansas City soon, and literally nationwide. We'd like to model this. Uh, that given a stable set of married parents in a good environment that provides for their educational, vocational, job skill, life skill, counseling, a lot of counseling needed, spiritual development, these kids will thrive. And sure enough, the four we've started with, they are thriving. And we knew they would. They just needed a stable base from which to do it. Mm -hmm. so and and if, if anyone who's listening now, if they want to know more about it, what's the uh, website address, if you will? It is very simply a seat at the table.org. Okay, wonderful. Bob, I want to thank you so much for taking your time today to talk about, uh, as, as, I, as I call it, the, the, the Kuhlmeyer case. It is. Even though officially it's Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everything that you and your wife and others do with uh, a seat at the table. And more importantly, uh, thank you for your involvement way back in 1983 in, in, in talking to Kathy after you left and saying, contact the ACLU or the student, you know, press law uh, group. But uh, thank you for all that you, that you have done and you continue to do. My honor, but what credit goes to you guys and to Kathy. So hats off to you.